number 21. We have text this morning. I know you're excited for the match to be back next week. I'm excited. We've been praying for them. Seeing what God's going to do there. I know he's doing the work already. We thank God for that. And we just continue to pray as we seek God in these days to come. Always excited what God's about to do. Always excited about the prospect of heaven. That's a good thought, isn't it? <laughs> Revelation chapter number 21. Find your place there. Hold it. Turn back to Revelation chapter 1, if you would. Find your text will be Revelation 21. Look back at chapter number 1 just very quickly. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 9 says... John kind of uh, sets it up, the book, and says, I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation, in the kingdom and the patience or the perseverance of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Most likely by this time, this is late in John's life. He may be in his 90s. Most all the disciples are, have been martyred. They've been uh, crucified some. Some have been had their heads, lost their heads, and Different, different burned at the stake and different means they've all been martyred and John's most likely about the last one left. He's been exiled to an island by himself, he says, for the word of God. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Heard a voice behind me as a great voice as of a trumpet saying I'm Alpha and Omega. We know who that is, don't we? The first and the last. What you see, he said, write in a book. He's commanded in verse 11, he says, what you see, I want you to write it down, John. I want you to write it in a book, and I want you to send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Over a hundred times in the book of Revelation, you'll read the word saw, or see, or heard, or hear. John will talk about what he hears, and he'll tell us what he sees, because he's commanded in the first chapter to write it down, and to share it with. He, at 23 times, you'll read this phrase, and I saw. John will say, and I saw. And then he'll, and it's a, it's a, a chronological progression when, as things are changing through the book. It's, it's one of those key phrases. Uh, we certainly would look at all, but look in chapter 19, just flip a page back from our text. Uh, we see the, uh, the second coming of Christ, verse 11, and I saw heaven open. And the whole white horse and him that set upon him who was faithful and true. Goes on and tells us his name is the word of God. We know it's Jesus. It's the, it's, it's the second coming. We see in uh, uh, verse 19, and I saw, and he talks about the group that comes against him. In verse, chapter 20, verse 1, and I saw an angel. We move into the millennial reign there. And Satan's bound for a thousand years. And at the end of that thousand years, Satan is loosed in verse 11 of chapter 20. And I saw a great white throne. Perhaps some of the most feared verses that will ever be heard for the lost man. You think about that. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, John said. He's telling us what he said. Standing before God. The books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the land of fire. The Bible is made up of 66 books. It's made up of, I think it's 1196 verses. All but four of those verses, all but four of those chapters, sorry, chapters, 1196 chapters, all but four of those chapters deal in some way with sin, with our relation to it, God getting us out of it, our worshiping him because of his grace and mercy that he showed. But all but four of those chapters talk about our sin, and they're finished up in verse 15 and chapter number 20. 
First two chapters, and we say it's like bookends. There's, the Bible is, has sinless bookends. You've got chapter 1 and 2, there chapter 1, and the creation account, and the creation account. Over and over and over, God, as he's creating in chapter 1, he talks about, you know, and he created the, 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 the light, and he created uh, 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 water, and, and, and fish, and birds, and everything's good. And everything, all through chapter 1, everything is good. Why? Because there's no sin. You get to the very end of chapter 1 on day 6 after he's created man in his own image and he says and it was very good. And then chapter 2 he kind of reiterates what's happened. He, he sort of he hangs up, gives us a skeleton in chapter 1 but in chapter 2 he begins to put some meat on those bones and tell us more about the creation. And it's not until you get to verse 18 of chapter 2 that anything is not good and the Bible says it was not good that man should be alone. Only thing that's not good God fixed that, didn't he? Gave us a woman. Gave Adam a wife. Gave Eve. Everything's wonderful. Then you get to chapter 3. And from chapter 3 all the way to Revelation chapter 20, in some form or fashion, every verse and every chapter is talking, it's dealing with our sin problem. But then we get to verse 15. And it's taken care of. The great white throne judgment's over. And we enter the last two chapters, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. The last two chapters, chapter number 20. We'll do something just a little bit different this morning. I don't want you to stand. You don't even have to read along. I, if you would, I'd just like you to close your eyes for a moment and listen. Because I tell you what John saw. John says, and I saw. One more time, we read that phrase. John says, and this is what I saw. And I saw a new head. And a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. <clears throat> and I, John, saw the holy sea. New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He'll dwell with them, and they're going to be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said unto me, Right, for these words are true and they're faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I give to him that's a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He shall be my son. Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you for this day. You've given us, Lord, for your, for your word, God, that you commanded John to write down some 2,000 years ago. That we could just get a glimpse. I ask, God, that your spirit would walk these aisles. I pray, God, you would Come upon this podium, this, this, this platform. You'd speak to my heart this morning, God. You would help us to just get as much of a glimpse as humanly possible of the things that you've got prepared for those of us. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. John says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I don't know about you, but I like new things. I've been poor most of my life. I've had to prop about everything I've got up. Uh, my house, my cars, my tractors, about everything I've ever had. I, I, I'm not a very good mechanic at all, to be honest with you. But by necessity, I've had to be one. And so when I've had opportunity in later years to, to purchase something new, I enjoy that. I like something that you don't have to work on every day of your life. And John talks about that early. He talks about these new things. We've got some new things coming. I don't know about you, but that helps me. He said, and I saw, he sees this new universe. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, you know if you know your Bibles that when, 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 we, when we're in the Bible, we read about heaven, there's at least three that this talked about. And the only way you can tell the difference is by the context that you read. Sometimes it's talking about, and what I can remember is that heaven where the sparrows fly. 
In other words, just above your head, just, just, just the atmosphere, the air that we breathe, there's that heaven. And sometimes the Bible's talking about that when it says the heaven. It talks about the sparrows in the heaven. And then sometimes he's talking about the, uh, the, that level right above that where the stars are. The, 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 we think about the universe, but the outer space, that part that's above us, where we've gotten to a few times, we can send a rocket ship or whatever. And we sometimes we're talking about that area. And then sometimes, and most of the time, what we think about is that place where the saints are. Isn't it? We think about where God is. Well, when he, in verse 1, he's talking about those first two areas when he says he sees a new heaven and a new earth. He's talking about that area from here into the outer space area. And John says, I looked up and I saw a brand new heaven and earth. Now, there's disagreement among believers, and, and you can be on either side and, be, and, and, and still be you know, doctrinally correct, and, and we'll be friends. Some people believe that God's just going to sort of scorch the top of this thing, just sort of sterilize it, if you will, and then, and then start over. Others believe he's just going to blow the whole thing up and start over. Uh, I think Peter, if you want to flip back, we're going to look at about two different verses this morning besides this, but flip back to the book of 2 Peter. I think he makes it the clearest in 2 Peter chapter uh, number 9 says, uh, verse 10, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. Looks like that's going to be a pretty big fire, don't you? Says they're going to be dissolved. Says the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. If I understand this right, He's going to burn it, slap up, and then take what's left, take the dust, and create a new one. Now, if you don't agree with that, that's fine. We'll still love one another. But I believe that's what he's, he's given to John. He says, I saw a new heaven. It, it, it wasn't just like the old one, but there was some continuity between it. He said, I saw a new heaven, and I saw a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were past. The question arises, why is he getting rid of it, you suppose? What is it? That 196 chapter we talked about. It's sin. It's like he's, he's cleansing this earth. This earth, as the Bible tells us, is groaning, waiting for redemption. And so there's a, there's judgment that takes place. I've never thought about that this to this week. But you know it says there's no more sea. And we know the, the earth is made up of about three-fourths water. Isn't it? This, this whole thing is made up of water. Our whole system is run from seawater, if you will. That seawater I've read is, our, is the is the cleansing for all the, 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 the junk that we throw out and it flows down the river and then it flows into the ocean. They say that seawater is made up of oxygen and hydrogen and chlorine. That's the kind of stuff we use in water to make things taste right. And not be not kill you when you drink it, is it? It's, it's a, that, that sea is that purifying process. We don't need it anymore. This new heaven, not that it won't have any water. We're going to, if, you, if we were to read ahead of this a chapter, we'd see that, that man, that big old river flowing out of the throne of God. There's plenty of water, but it's not the sea no more. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first one. It's gone. John says, I saw a new city. Every verse you read through here, it just gets better. He says, I saw a new city. I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, here's the thing. The city, it doesn't need to be cleansed, does it? It's doing real good right now. Right now, the Bible says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Doesn't it say that? The, 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 one of our, the believer dies in the moment he's taken into the very presence of Jesus Christ. Heaven is not rebuilt. Heaven is relocated. That heaven. I, John, saw the holy city. It's just coming down from where it's been all the time. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and angels and saints and those who have gone on and all believers of all the ages, and here they come. John says, this is what I saw. I'm telling you what I saw. And I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. 
And look how he, look how he, he explained, he said, to, to prepare is a bride adorned for her husband. You know, I feel a little of the pain this morning because I, I knew when I started this message, there's no possible way, there's not human language to describe what John has just said. I don't have the education, I don't have the language, and John didn't either. But John's try, John is trying, he, he's using every, every capacity that he has, all of his wits to try to paint a picture for what he's seeing. He's trying to tell us he's seen something he's never seen before. And he says, I, I, she, I saw this city coming down. This, I saw, and it was, the best he could describe it was a, a bride prepared for her husband. You know, I've done a few weddings in my life. And late, probably not, I didn't appreciate, I don't think, early on the, the importance of it. But later on, I have. And when the wedding march starts, Everybody stands up. Who do they look at? The bride. They're looking at the bride. I, in the last few years, when the wedding march starts and everybody looks up, I look at the groom. Mm -hmm. Hadn't seen one yet. Didn't have tears coming out of that. <laughs> when he looks out there and he sees that bride, he's not seen her for at least a day, typically. But he's not seen her. And he sees it. He, he, and the, the thought's going through his mind. This is my bride. This is that one that God created just for me. I can't believe she said yes to the dress, but here she comes. <laughs> you know, I, I, just all the things, and he, he explains it as a bride adorned, and the word adorned is, is the word that we get our word cosmetics from. She's got all the cosmetics. It, it doesn't matter if she's poor or if she's rich if she's poor. She borrows stuff from everybody that she knows jewels and, and, and whatever they make them beautiful. She put, she, we'd say in East Texas, she put on the dog. Amen. I mean, she's put on the dog. She's, this is the day this little girl's waited for her entire life. This is that special day, and she wants to be so special for her grooming. And John said, there she is. John looks up and he says, and he said it at least 20-something times at this point, but he said it one more time. He says, and I saw that heavenly sin. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. He sees her coming. I think about, in fact, hold, I said it's going to look at one other thing. Look over the book of Hebrews, if you would. Hebrews chapter number 11. That great Hall of Faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should afterward receive the inheritance, he obeyed and he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned, he dwelled, he went from pillar to post in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him, according to the promise, in verse 10 says, Why is he, why is he, why did, why did Abraham stop somewhere? Why does Abraham keep going everywhere? Verse 10 says, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker. Abraham, I can just see him going through the promised land and come to this big city and says, that ain't it. <laughs> he comes to another one and says, no, that's not what I'm looking for. John says, I saw what he was looking for. John says, I, 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 I looked and I saw, and this is what I saw. He said, I saw that holy city. Later on in this chapter, he'll talk about the foundation emeralds and the walls and the gates and all that good stuff. But here he just says, I saw it. And then verse 3, John tells us what he hears. He says he saw a new universe and he sees a new city and it's getting better all the time. He says, I saw, I heard and he's going to tell us about a new community. And I heard a great voice out of heaven say, behold the tabernacle of God is with he will dwell with them. He's going to, they're going to be his people. God himself. I like it when he says it that way. Some of you English teachers can tell me what that means. I know one thing it means is good. God himself. He says it twice. Not God himself shall be. It's not Gabriel. It's not, you know, Michael. He says, no, God himself is going to be with them. He's going to be their God. There's a new. He's behold. This boy says, behold. God is setting up his tent among his people. God has come to dwell with us. 
Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he's going to dwell with us. And we're going to be his people, and he's going to be our God, and, and he's going to be with us. And all the things that has kept us, I don't know about you, but since I've been saved, last week would be since 1987. It's 30-some-odd years. I hadn't counted, but mid middle 30, maybe close to 40 years. In all those years, there's all there's been this longing. There's been this longing to, we sang that song, you know, what a glorious day that will be when I look upon his face. I've been looking. I, I, I've had, that's been a desire in my heart. And the older I get, the more that desire grows. Amen. How I long to be able to, to, to have fellowship with God unhindered. Because my sin nature, there's always been something. You know, I know the Lord, and He knows me, and I'm His, and I'm born again. But there's just, there's just always, you want to be a little closer. You want to know Him a little better. But when this day comes, this new communion, it's going to, Paul says it doesn't yet appear what we shall be like. But we know we're going to be like He is, because we're going to see Him as He is. In my sinless, perfected body, I'm going to worship the King of Kings. And that little God-shaped vacuum preachers we've talked about for all these years that's inside of everybody, and nothing can fill that vacuum except God is going to be completely filled in that day. That I may know Him. That I may know Him. He says, God Himself shall be with them and be their God. There's going to be a new communion. And that new communion is going to, going to turn into a brand new, it's just going to become a lie. As it says in verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears. He, in John, in trying to explain what he seeks, he uses the bride. And now he's going to try, he's trying to tell us what he's seeing. He's going to tell us by using things that's, he's going to tell us what's not going to be there. If, if I were to say to you, I'm, I'm going to Colorado. I'm going to go into the mountains, and I, I, I've been there once, I really do like that kind of country. I, I, want, I want to go to Colorado. And I, I, I'm going next week. If I were to say I'm going next week to Colorado, up in the mountains, I mean, I'm going to enjoy it. And you've never been there before. You've never really you said, well, tell me about it, Brother Jay. What about, where, where are you going? I said, well, i tell you this. There's not going to be any heat. Not going to be any humidity when we get there, I'll tell you that for sure. Not going to be any smog. And, and I just I start using language to try to help you understand what I'm telling you what's not going to be there. Well, that's what John does. He says he says he's uh, he's going to tell us some things that's not going to be in, in in this new Jerusalem. There's not going to be any tears. Can you imagine that? No tears. There, there'll be no death. It's like it's like God says, not here. Ain't happening here. When, when we get to that new Jerusalem, there's not going to be any, there's no death. I wonder how many funerals this group, this body that's sitting here has attended in their life. There is no telling me at the funerals we've attended, at the loved ones we've watched go on, at the separation. God says, not there. Not going to be any tears. There's not going to be any, any, any death. There's, no, there's not going to be no sorrow. Not going to be no crying. There's, there, there's not going to be any pain. All these things that are associated with sin. All these things that happen because of sin. Sin's gone. Verse, verse 15 is taken care of. John says, I tell you what I saw. I saw a world where there was no children without daddies. No wives without husbands. There was no cancer. You name it. Those things that have broken our hearts through the years. Not here. God says they not come in this place. This is God's city. Had they there, there's none in God's city now, but God's city is going to relocate, and it's relocating right here. He's going to cleanse this earth. We're going to get a brand new earth. We're going to get a brand new universe. And then heaven is going to relocate to right here. And you and I are going to get in on it. And, and, and even though there's no way to explain what all is going to be there, I 
think maybe we'll be like the Apostle Peter when he stood on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John and he said it's good to be here. And you think about it. You just think about it. What, what, how great that will be to see those loved ones that's gone on that we've not seen. And those, those babies that's died young. And, and children and all those. And yet they're all there. And yet that ain't even the best part at all. God himself's there. Man. God himself will be their God. Jesus is there. He's the star. The Bible goes on and says, they don't have a, there's no light switch. They don't need it because God lights the whole thing up. Jesus is there. He's at the, at the end of the street. There he is. And at the end of the river where the river's flowing out from under, there he is. And he's the attraction. And we can worship him in truth and in spirit. No hindrance whatsoever. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. No, all, the former things that dealt with sin, they're gone. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, in case, in case I miss something, John said, the Lord said, I make all things new. And he said to me, John, you write it down. Tells him again, he's already told him to write it. John's writing it, but he said, John, write it down. These words are true and faithful. I, I know you think this is too good to believe, but John, you put her down, it's going to happen just as sure as I'm sitting here. And he said to him, it's done. <laughs> I'm Alpha and Omega, first and the last. This is Jesus, the beginning and the end. And I will give to him that's the first. He finishes and he talks about a new universe, and a new city, and a new relationship or communion. He describes our new life. But then before he leaves the text, he talks about an old invitation. An old invitation. He said, John, when you write it down, and you go back and you tell them about it, he said, I want you to tell them this. I want you to tell them that anybody that's thirsty, Jesus stood, the Bible said in John chapter 7, that great day of the feast, and cried and said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and take of the water of life says in our text this morning I will give to him that's thirsty of the fountain of the water of life free he that overcometh who's he that overcometh but he that trusts Jesus Christ he that overcometh he says shall inherit all things and I'm going to be his God he's going to be my son and he does it one more time. If you flip your page to the right, and you get almost to the last verses of this book, the whole book of Revelation and the entire Bible, and you get to verse number 17. And he says, John, before you close the book, give them one last invitation. He gives the old invitation. And he says, for the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that's thirsty, come. And he said, John, give them one more. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life free. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be white, black. It makes no difference. Whosoever, whosoever is thirsty. I suspect most of us here have been saved for a long time, but it might be that there's somebody here that doesn't know the Lord. I can tell you, based on the authority of the Word of God, that if you're thirsty this morning, if you'll come, you can drink of this fountain of water. According to the word of God, you can be saved like you did in this talk. Isn't that something? Brother Jay, you don't have any idea. I've, I've lived a horrible life. It makes no difference. You can leave this place more pure than the day you were born because you were born in sin, according to the word of God. <coughs> Completely forgiven, forgiven of everything and cleansed and brand new. Perhaps somebody just like to come to this altar and just pray and just, just thank God what he's got in the future for us. Perhaps you'd like to come and, and rededicate your life. I don't know what the Lord has spoken to your heart. Whatever he says to you, do it. But as we stand this morning, and I tell you what, I didn't find it in the book, sisters. Let's, I think we all know it. Let's, let's sing that old song we all know. Let's all stand. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more.
Okay, uh, so she is uh, in desperate need of prayer, you know, from us and all this kind of stuff, just for not only her her double vision and all those problems associated with that, but also for the new chemo that she's going to have to have. So, uh, long road to hope for uh, Miss Kathy and all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, I think that's all the updates I have. Anybody need an update on anybody else that I did not do? Oh yeah, David Martin. Uh, went uh, talked to David and Margaret in this week. Took them over some uh, firewood and uh, type deal for them. And you know, and he was very appreciative. But he has uh, failed a week ago Monday. Uh, kind of bunged himself up. This type deal. He's on a walker now. Uh, they're doing okay. Uh, David said he can't get around very well, so he didn't know when they're going to be able to come back to back to class. And I said, you know. You can use that for two weeks. After that, you you don't have to use it anymore. So anyway, so hopefully next week they'll be back with us. Uh, they're they're struggling a lot right now with you know health problems and everything else. So continue to remember you know David Martin and Lynn. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Roger and Claire. Last time I talked to them was about two two weeks ago. I believe it was. Type deal. Uh, he is still struggling with health problems. That type deal. They just uh, they just. I, he said we're getting by day to day, so you know whatever that means. You know, we, I told him if he wasn't so old, he wouldn't have that problem. But anyway, but they, you know, he just kind of laughed and yeah, right. So anyway, but uh, but they're they're hoping to get back soon. They just don't know when. They think every week this is going to be the weekend we get back, and then we're going to see them and you know that that type of deal. So we're hoping for next week. Just get in to lift them up in prayer. So they both have a have a lot of health issues and this type of deal that they're dealing with. Okay, anybody else? Cindy Hale, Miss Cindy is uh, should be back. Well, there's Curtis sitting right there. Curtis, give him an update on Miss Cindy. Curtis should be back with her a week. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> they have a softball tournament this weekend. Good, good. And make it, she's making Kayla get up and move and get on with it, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I heard last time that uh, Kayla was enjoying being waited on by Miss Cindy, and so Miss Cindy was fixing to abandon the ship and say, hey, you're on your own now. You know, you, 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 so much of this taken care of, the type of anyway, but we just thank God that everything went good for Miss Kayla and her, her surgeries and all the things that she's gone through. Yes, we Have you heard from Stuart Cates? Uh, Stuart Cates, talk to him, uh, I lose my days, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, he is still waiting on insurance to, to give him uh, basically the okay to go ahead with the surgery for his uh, cancer on his kidney. They don't have that yet unless he got it late this week because I have not talked to him later in the week. But, uh, you know, he is waiting on that okay so that he can go in there looking to or praying, hoping to only take part of the kidney. I think it's his left kidney. Only take part of the kidney because the cancer is in one section of it. So they're hoping to just take part of one kidney instead of taking the entire entire one one of the whole kidneys all out so you don't have one kidney so therefore it take part of it so you still have a kidney and a half or whatever else so uh but they still don't know anything they know they've got to do that they're just waiting to like all of us on these things waiting to get the okay from the insurance company to uh to do something with it okay <laughs> anybody else okay okay if you think of somebody yell at me we'll we'll try to get it on there okay uh Tonight, um, tonight, it seems like tonight, it's been up since ever, forever. Uh, today, we're going to cover just a few minutes about our Sunday school, I mean, our homework studies in Mark chapter 11. There it is, got more glean. Mark chapter 11, you know, type deal. We begin in verse verse 15. I have to look and see where it is because I, I don't have it you know, right in front of me. But Mark chapter 11, verse 15. <clears throat> this is front front to where Jesus is talking, talking at this point. It says, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning, as they were along, as, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, 
and does not doubt in his heart, but believes in what he says will happen. It will be it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you have stayed, stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. <clears throat> this you could spend thirty minutes on these few verses here, but uh, you know I know you studied these this week, and you've been faithful to do that. So we'll just take just a second. First of these is talking about here that Jesus is, you know, the background of all that. Jesus goes in to clean up the temple. The temple area has been defiled, and they've been defiled because of all the things that they're doing there. They're robbing people by changing money from what their money into the temple tax money. So they're charging exorbitant fees to do that. They're selling, uh, you know, things, animals and all to be sacrificed, on and on and on. All these things are taking the word, the temple of God away from worship and into the worldly realm, if you will. We see that today in the Hebrew studies. We get there and do the same thing. And he's saying you are not to defile the house of God. The house of God is sacred because that is where you and I come to worship the King. We, we so, so many times we forget that. We come, we come to church or we come to Sunday school, but we fail to come to Sunday school or fail to come to church sometime taking that time to worship the King. You know, that's what God is saying. You know, he wants to meet with you. He is there for you. That is his temple. That is his tabernacle, if you will. If you will. Meeting place where the, you and I are the church. And you and I, the church, are to praise our, our Savior and our Lord. Okay? Uh, the other part you know, goes down and talks about uh, the, the, the belief and knowing. As you pray, pray knowing that God is going to answer your prayers. Uh, that's something that you and I as Christians have that nobody else has. Because God hears every prayer that you lift up and I lift up. And God answers every one of those prayers. Every one of them. He may not answer them like you want to, or he may not answer them in the time frame that we think is, and all this kind of stuff, but he has promised us that he's going to answer every prayer that we have. We pray knowing and praying in God's will. Same thing in Hebrew. Let's tie it right back into our Hebrew study, our Sunday school study, about as we pray, pray in God's will, that God's will be done and not mine and your will. That's where we get lost. That's where we, we have a tendency to stray away from God because God doesn't answer my prayers. He didn't answer my prayers the way I wanted answered. He answered my prayer. Okay? So just know that God promises throughout Scripture that He will not only hear every prayer that His children lift up, He will answer every prayer. He will answer a prayer in a way that you will be blessed. We may receive our peace, our joy, our happiness, that type of deal. We may sit and not receive that in this lifetime, but you will receive it. You will receive it. It may be standing before the judgment seat of Christ before you see the blessings that God bestowed on you of the prayers that you lifted up. But he is answering every prayer, and he will be in your life and be in the life of those that you're praying for. Okay? What a great God we have. Okay? Anybody like to say anything about the Mark passage? I had two or three of you come to me after and said, well, I started to say this, but this takes too long. And I said, doesn't make any difference anyway. If you want to say it, say it, okay? That's why we're here, because somebody may need to know what you think that is here, okay? Because there's so many other things in this, in this passage also, okay? Okay, back to our Sunday school passage, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 4 is where we're up. We finished up with last week. This is including exhortations that God gives the people, the Christians of, he of Hebrews. Here he's talked about, in verse 4 he talked about the marriage. We talked about that last week and how, how God brings judgment on people that stray away from his word. And one of the examples he gives us here is marriage. We know back, we go back in history, how, how Jerusalem, how, how the Jews were affected how Jews were brought, were brought judgment on them by God because them straying away from what God had in his plan and by his scripture of one man, one woman, and a holy matrimony. As they went away from those and became one guy and two guys, one lady, two ladies, to whatever it may be, living together out of wedlock, on and on and on, and on all these things against God's will, that they, they brought judgment on the house of Israel. Okay? And because of that, they... they they destroyed the temple. They destroyed their, the temple at that time in the 80s, 70 judgment on them. And many people died from that point. 
Same thing we're in today is we have defiled, as the United States has defiled, the same thing. What we have done to abortion, what we have done to the definition of what marriage is, on and on and on. God promises in verse 4, God says, I will bring judgment on you. I hate it when I, you know, I read something that says, God says, I'm going to bring judgment on you tomorrow because of what you did. That's scary. That is really scary. If it's not scary for you, you need to get on your, on your knees because you don't understand who God is. God loves you. People think God loves them, therefore he will not bring judgment on them. God didn't say that. God says, I'm going to love you through it while I bring judgment on you. I am the provider for you and I'm provider for your eternal life and your salvation. I am not the provider for your happiness as you go through your and sin in your life. He brings things in our life so that we will grow spiritually. So we will change to what God wants us to be. What we're supposed to be. Okay? And because of the things we allow to happen and things we do, God brings judgments on us personally. He brings judgment on us as a nation. And that's where we are today. Judgment on us as a nation. I'm just praying for rapture every day. Because God is sick and tired as we see there's a shaking. As we look through revelations, we do those things. And God is talking about the shaking of the earth. The shaking, the getting people's attention. The, hey, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. We don't know when that is. Revela I mean, rapture may happen today, tomorrow, next week, next month. 40,000 years from now. I have no idea. But we know that everything is completed. Everything in Scripture is done. We are to that point where God pulls the trigger and said, The day is the day that I bring my children home. So we are prepared and prepare all those around us to prepare for today being the day that He calls His children home. Praise the Lord. I hope it is today. Maybe today. Okay. Verse 5 says, keep your, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Here, you know, many people we hear and we say, and we, you know, many of us, the quote says, you know, money is the root of all evil. Scripture does not say that. Money has no intrinsic value as far as being good or evil. It is just a means of exchange. You know, a dollar bill is a dollar bill. 20 cents is 20 cents, whatever those things are. What he is talking about, what Scripture says, the love of money is what is, what is evil. Yeah. And the love of money, why it is evil? Because we are replacing God as the, as the one of our worship in our life, that God in our life. We're replacing the Almighty Father with money and what money can do for us or what money can buy for us. We have decided that you know we, we, we don't need God. We need more cash. We need more investments. We need more whatever it may be. Okay? God says, you know, we don't take any of that with us. The only thing you take with us is the good works we do for God here on this earth. That's all we take out of here. We take our salvation because God has promised that. God is holding that secure. But, you know, make sure that you do not, you know, get in the point where money is more important than anything else that we do in our lives. Because it says that be content with what you have. You know, God is going to bless you. God has promised to bless you. God has promised to provide for us. And he is going to bless us and provide for us of the things that we need, not the things that we want. God never says he's going to give you what you want. Okay? He never says that to us. But he says he will provide for us in the things that we need. Okay? <clears throat> he goes down and says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. De Deuteronomy 31.6, Joshua 1.5. He makes that promise to us and for us that says that he will always be there whenever we need him. What a wonderful thought that is to be the king that's making a promise to me and you saying that he's going to provide for us. Not that, you know, he's going to give us everything we want. I remember growing up back in that little rural area of Alabama, you know, type deal, and I was growing up in the 50s and 60s and this type of deal. You know, I looked around and I, we didn't realize we was poor because everybody was poor. Everybody didn't, didn't have anything. You had enough to get on the table to eat and, eat and fill your belly of that, that, that next meal or whatever it may be. And you, you know, it was God provided for us the joys of family, the joys of what he had for us in our life. You didn't realize that. You didn't realize you needed more money every day because there was no more money coming in. But God blessed us. He blessed us as a family. He blessed us with eight kids. And out of those eight kids, each one of them, many of them today are teaching Sunday school. 
teaching God's Word. You know, what a blessing God does. And God, how God blesses us each and every day. He said, never will I leave you nor forsake you. In the times that God brings trials and tribulations on us to grow us spiritually, to make us spiritually mature, God is standing right there with us as we go through each one of those trials. And he is making us stronger. And he's making sure that, you know, that we're, we're able to get through them. Verse 6 says, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my heifer, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Psalms 118, 6, three quote. God says that, you know, that he is always going to be there. The world cannot affect you. The world cannot take your salvation from you. Once you become a child of God, that is secure and always. Do not ever think. The only thing that is important for us here in this world today is our salvation. That's the only thing we carry out of here is our eternal life. And God is going to help us hold that eternal life in his hand, not yours and ours, yours and mine. So therefore, no way man can affect you to the point of saying he can take your salvation from you. He can take your joy from you. Because God holds that in his hand and not mine and yours. Now, can the world take away your happiness? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because our happiness depends on the, on the situations around us. Our joy depends on God. Of what God has for us and God, what God wants us to be. Okay? Verse 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. He is telling them here to consider, to look to, to, to study the leaders of their religious leaders that they sit under each and every day. Look and see how they lead their lives, how they trust in God in their lives how they worship God, how they give God his adoration and praise that he so richly deserves each and every day. Look at those and then pattern our lives to do exactly the same thing. You and I are to the point now of being older and everything else. You and I are those leaders that people are looking to today. The young people around us are looking at you and I to see how we live, how we live for God, and how we conduct ourselves in, in, as far as between each other, our brothers love half each other, and this type of deal. We are the examples that people are looking to now to be the workmen of God in this, in this world. Great responsibility. Great responsibility. You never compare yourself to the people around you. Never compare yourself to your friends or your neighbors or a leader or whatever else, that type of deal. You only compare your life to one person, and that is Jesus Christ. If you, measure, if you can measure up to people around you, that's not good enough. They're sinful. They're evil. They fall away from what God has for them in their life. But when you compare your life to Jesus Christ and how he is and how he led and how he forgave people and everything else, we fall way short. And that's why we compare ourselves to Jesus and not to people around us. Okay? Because God wants us to, to imitate those people that went before us. Imitate those great leaders that, that showed us God in, their, in the way to walk. You know, we have many of them, and everybody has their own ones. You know, many people speak of Billy Graham and on and on, and all the, all the other great religious peoples that, that have led this country and led the world, people, the world itself to, you know, toward God. Imitate those things. But most of all, we imitate one person, and that's Jesus. How he forgave his enemies, how he forgave those that, he forgave those that crucified him. How much more did that take than me to forgive somebody that hurt my poor little feelings? My goodness. <laughs> my goodness. Who do I think I am that I can hold against somebody for a word they said that I probably took out of context anyway? <coughs> Understand that we compare ourselves to Jesus and live for him each and every day. Verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What a beautiful verse. We so many times misunderstand that verse, okay? We know that Jesus and God is not, not, not changeable at all. He is unchangeable as far as his nature, before, as far as who he is, okay? We know that you know, he, is un, he is unchangeable as far as being divine and eternal. When God says and God makes a covenant with you and I, he acts on that covenant and he never changes that. 
The promises he gives us as Christians, as a father to a son, or a father to a daughter, he never changes that. He never backs up on it. He never makes a modification to what he does. When God says, I'm going to hold your salvation in my hands until you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that's the end of sentence. He doesn't say, well, unless. Or next year, they're going to say, well, I'm going to hold that for a while, but then I'm going to give it back to you, then I'll take it back if I need to. God never does any of those. He never changes in those things. His divine nature, his, his self of who he is, okay? And the way he provides for us and what he wants, to, wants us to be. The covenants he makes with us and he promises us to do, he will fulfill. As we read through scripture and he talks about all the judgment he's going to send on the sins of people and sins of lives, you know, when he talks about the judgment he's going to send, he will send those. Sometimes we look at that and read and say, well, no, he changed his mind because he says he's going to destroy these people and he waited 40 years to do it. He didn't change his mind. He just changed the time frame. He still destroys those people. If you read back through Scripture, he talks about he's going in and wiped out this nation that's in front of them and it took them 100 years to do that. You finish down through Scripture, what did he do? He sent people in and wiped out that nation. God is divine and eternal. His promises is secure, and you can bank on it. Now, how is he unchangeable? And we, we read through Scripture, and sometimes we take the unchangeable part and put it into the changeable part, this type of deal. The, the changeable ways that God is is in person and programs, okay? God, Jesus is, change, is, is, is changeable in for as a person. Jesus was eternal, and Jesus was divine from day one of creation to forever, Nothing different about that. He is unchangeable in that. But he is changeable in the fact that at some point in time when he and God decided now is the time for him to come as a person, as a human on this world to be crucified for your nice, your nice sins, he became the totally divine and totally human. So that person himself was changeable in that he is fully both, both, both sections. He became fully, fully human so that he would know the aches and pains that me and you go through each and every day. He'll know how the world tempts him each and every day. And he'll also know, you know, the, the, the feelings we have and every, the thirst, the hunger, the desires. But Jesus differed you and I that he never succumbed to those that were sinful. Okay? And then after he was crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected on the third day, he became totally divine again. So as a person, he went from divine to totally, totally divine to totally divine and totally human back to totally divine. So he is changeable in those aspects. In programs, how is he changeable in programs? And programs that, 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 that he does, and you know, like food. We look it back to a scripture and it talks about from, from basically from Adam all the way up to Noah, the food that people, people ate were vegetarians. They ate no meat whatsoever. None at all. No, not only people, but animals were the same thing. From Noah to Moses, things changed. God came and said, you know, through, the, through this law and everything, he says, says basically that, that things are edible. There's things that you can eat, and you can eat meat. So we changed the program. Now you're not vegetarian. You may be veg you're vegetarian and, and meat eaters, okay? And all those things that we do. And then when, when you know, from Moses up to Jesus, he brought the law to us and says, well, now some things are good, some things are bad. Some, you know, back in Moses' time, everything was edible. It was up to them to, to eat and provide for themselves. Everything that walked and breathed. From Moses to Jesus, now it went back to the point where some were good, some were bad. Kosher, kosher food, if you will. Okay? So some things you could not eat, some things now you, you can eat. And then after Jesus died, he said, now I've made all things holy. Now then, you can, you can eat anything there is out there that God provides for you. So it's his, his programs and the things that he does, and you know, it's different. The other program which, is, which affects us so much, that doesn't affect us a whole lot. Most of us, like I am, Carol puts it on the table, I eat the mess. Okay? Where it's good or bad, tell her it's good. <laughs> Hadn't found anything yet that hasn't been good that she's put on the table. Okay? Uh, but you know, the other thing is, is the way he deals with us. The way he deals with me and you, the way he deals with human, humankind. He is changeable in that, that we looked at chapter 11 and it talks about those things. He is raising people from the dead. He is healing the sick. He is doing all those things. And we think because he 
raised one person from the dead or we he healed one person, then it, go, it, it now becomes a principle and he is going to raise everybody from the dead. He is going to raise, every, heal everybody from whatever they're sick of. Now we know that here in raising the dead and that, that type of deal, he is changeable and unchangeable. He does not promise he's going to raise everybody physically from the dead. He did make a promise that he's raised everybody that loves him and everybody has salvation from the dead spiritually to be with him. Okay? But he will not raise people physically back to, back to life. He will not raise everybody. If he chooses to do so, he will do so. Okay? He will not heal everybody we pray for. If he did, there would never be a Christian person ever dying again. Ever. Why? Because we have, we have friends and neighbors that pray for us that when we have problems in our life. When we're facing cancer or whatever it may be, and God would have to heal them. Okay? We know that it's going to happen again. In a thousand year reign, that's going to happen. They will never be sick to the point of death ever again in a thousand year reign. Once they're saved, they live for that entire thousand years and on into eternity. But until that point in time, to the thousand year reign and come at the tribulation period, you know, therefore, you know, just because somebody was healed from cancer doesn't mean everybody's going to be healed. His programs are different according to who you are. Not because of, you know, that you're some, some great person or whatever it may be, but, but whatever his will for your life and my life is. We remember chapter 11, he said, those that did not, but were not made well, those that were not raised and dead, have as great a blessing as those that did. So God is going to bless us all, because one day, one day, all of us as Christians are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And every one of us are going to be blessed by God. So we know that God is in his own way is so, so divine that everything he promises he's going to do for us, he's going to do for us. It may not be today. It may not be in this lifetime, but it will be done. Don't let anybody ever tell you that God is not going to take care of you. That you as a child of God is not going to stand and, and worship God for eternity in the presence of God. That's a promise, that's a covenant, that is something that, that, that Jesus said, and that will happen, okay? We pray for each other that, you know, they will be healed. Will that happen? They will be healed. They may die physically, but they will be healed. Just like uh, you know, Revelation 21, as Brother Jay is talking about today in, in this message, no, Revelation 21 don't take every pain, every tear from your eye, the suffering from the, that you're going through. He's going to take care of all those things at somewhere, at some point in time. What a great God we have. Wow. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. What a promise that is for us. Okay. God wants us to see that in his word, to understand that in his word, and understand that applies to you and to me. That applies to us as Christians. That applies to us as a nation. That applies to everything that comes about that we stand before Christ with. What an awesome God we serve. Awesome God we serve. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word, Father. Thank you for the, the truths that, that you just project to us, Father. We, we can see and we can pattern our lives after the one that is, that is so perfect. Father, help us to forgive our neighbors. Help us to forgive those people that sin against us. Father, help us to walk in your light and not in the light of the world. Father, we know that you love us. Father, make that especially close to us. Help us to understand, Father, that sometimes in our lives we don't understand God's love. In this physical life, sometimes God's love hurts. It hurts us in mourning for our loved one. It hurts us in, in passing of someone with a disease or whatever else, Father, but you are still in control. And Father, we know and we look past those hurts to understand, God, that, that you have promised that we will see them again. You're only separating us for a short period of time, and then we'll be back together again. Oh God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your power that you can do everything that you say you're going to do. Bless, keep, and guide us. Be with those that need our prayers. Let them feel the warmth of your love as we pray for them each and every day. Lead God and direct us. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Love you. See you next week.